Hey there guys, Mike here again. Thanks for clicking this video. Welcome to my shop. I previously did a poll on my community page on what type of amp projects you guys would like to see me build. A 6L6 amp ranked pretty high and roughly about the same time PS Vane reached out to me and said, hey, we are launching this new brand of Horizon tube and would you be interested in incorporating those tubes in some of your amp projects? And I'm like, oh, okay, this sounds pretty interesting. We all know that tubes and transformers are quite expensive and any help we can get to build our projects is much appreciated. So I gave them a list of like the projects I'm going to be building and voila, they sent me a bunch of tubes. So in this video, I'm going to be building a 6L6 amp using PS main tubes. For this amplifier build, we're going to be using a 12AU7. So 12AU7 is a twin triode low mu tube. So we'll be using one per channel. And for the output section, we'll be using a single 6L6. So 6L6 is a pento tube and it's possible to dissipate over 20 watts. Looking at the spec sheets for both tubes, they look pretty normal to other manufacturers. So I'm not expecting anything out of the ordinary here. So for this amplifier design, you do something a little bit different, a little bit out of the box. I haven't really seen anything like this done before. Well, actually you may have. So this amplifier is gonna be designed as an integrated amplifier. I don't plan to use a preamp with it. Since the 12AU7s don't have a lot of amplification factor, I'm gonna be using both triodes to get enough voltage swing to reasonably drive the 6L6. The output section will be single-ended, so I only need one 6L6 per channel. And on the output transformer, I'm gonna be utilizing the screen tap for ultralinear connection. I haven't done this before, so I'm kind of curious on how it will sound. So I do realize I might have to adjust some of the voltages and bias points, but that's the fun part of this project. So let's talk about the transformers we're gonna be using. So for the power transformer, we're gonna use this through chassis mount type. So this is a 700 volt center tap. It does have a five volt heater winding circuit for tube rectifier, but we're going with solid state, so we won't be using that. For the output transformers, we're gonna go with this Edcore XSE 15-8-5K. So this is a single ended 15 watt 5K primary with an eight ohm secondary output transformer. I've used Edcore in the past, and I'm really happy with the performance. They have a really great website and they have a host of different transformers you can select from. And if not, they'll custom wind you something.
Well, the chassis is all complete and I think it turned out pretty good. This chassis took a lot longer than I thought it would be. There was little nuances to it, which I kind of overlooked, um, but I'll get into that later in the video. I ended up creating a separate plate that will mount on the inside, and that will house all the terminal strips and tube sockets, and this will be recessed down. So when you put the tube sockets in, it will kind of recess into the chassis a bit and kind of give it a more of a 3D look feel of it. I like this way method um, because I can do all the wiring first and makes it really easy and obtainable to get at everything. And then when I'm all done, I can just mount it in the chassis and finish wiring the transformers. As usual, I created a basic schematic and wiring layout, which I'll follow to build this amplifier. Once everything is working fine, I'll redo this into a nice PDS format and I'll link it in the description below. So the next step here is to do all the base grounding and bonding wiring, and then we'll put the rest of the components on and fire it into the chassis. So the wire you're gonna be using in this amplifier is 22K solid core Teflon coated. You wanna make sure that you get the proper voltage rating. So this wire here is rated for 600 volts and that's typically the type of voltage we would see with a tube amplifier. I use red for the signal in B plus and black for all the bonding and grounding. For the AC filament circuit, I'm gonna go with this 20 gauge. I typically like to go with two different colors, so when I wind it really tightly, I can keep track of it. I typically use this Kester's Rosin Core Leaded Solder. It is 0 0.031 of an inch or 0.8 of a millimeter. I like the solder, it flows really nice and it also wicks up really well if you make a mistake. I'll put a link in the description below for that solder. <music> So I have the grounding and filament wires all completed. Let's have a quick look here how the wires are run. So this section here is where the power supply capacitors will go. So it has its own grounding node that goes back to the star ground and everything else grounds back to this star ground. For the AC filament wires, we have the two different colors all tightly wound to the first 6L6, to the second 6L6, and then back to the 12 AU7s. So the rationale behind that is the 6L6s draw 0.9 of an amp each. So what we want to do is feed those first and then back to the 12 AU7s because they have a less of a current draw. This section over here, we will run our virtual center tap for our grounding for the heater circuit. So we'll run our two 100 ohm resistors back to a ground there. So all the B plus signal wires all completed here in red. We're ready to populate with the resistors capacitors. The one thing I do want to point out is it's almost impossible to avoid the AC filament circuit with your signal and B plus wires. And if you do have to cross, you want to make sure you cross over 90 degrees like I've done here and here and over here. What you don't want to do is run it adjacent to any AC wires here like that. For a longer stretch, um, that will inherently induce a 60 hertz hum into your circuit. And so you want to try to mitigate it as best as possible by either going shielded cable or making sure you're staying away and crossing over at 90 degrees. Bit of a wiring tip here. Any of the exposed leads I have on the resistors or the capacitors here and here, I cover up with some clear heat shrink. So I have this one millimeter clear heat shrink that has a two to one reduction ratio. And what I'll do, I'll slide that over and I solder it on. Typically the soldering gun will shrink one side of it, but then you have to go back in with the heat gun and kind of shrink the rest of it. And that makes it a little bit easier when you're probing around here, you don't accidentally touch or brush up against any exposed leads. So I got the main board all done here. Everything is mounted and it passes the resistance checks. Some things to note about it. The bias resistor of the 6L6s uh, can get quite hot. So we want to make sure that the bypass cap is a distance away. We don't want to degrade this so we can add extra life to this capacitor. And furthermore, the transformer here can get very high B plus and filter caps that are rated for 500 volts or more uh, are quite expensive. So I have two smaller ones in series of each other. So that will help with the high B plus when you immediately turn the amplifier on so we don't degrade these either. I got the chassis all ready to go here. I put some tape on here to help protect the finish. And this plate will just pop right into place and I can bolt it down. So a little bit of wiring here in the transformer. We're gonna test the filament circuit. 
So we've got the switch all in there with some shielded cable. The transformer is connected to the 120 volt voltage. We have the B plus stood off for now. We have the 5 volt stood off. We're not going to be using that. And we have the 6.3 filament circuit all connected. Got my multimeter connected to the back of the tube socket, so I'm on the green and yellow wire. And we're going to switch the multimeter to AC voltage there, and we're going to measure that. And we're running all through my current sink here, and the wall voltage is 119 volts. So if there's a direct short, that light bulb will light up. And if not, then we'll start reading proper voltage. So there is no tubes in here right now, so let's flick it on. And right now we're at 7.32 volts AC. So when there's tubes going in there, that will drop down closer to 6.3 volts. So now that we know that the 6.3 heater circuit is working, I put in some old tubes here for testing. So I have two old 6L6s and two 12AU7s. And we're going to turn it back on again, and we'll see what it draws. So you can see the tubes light up. So they're warming up, and right now it's 6.6 .6 volts. So I think that works. So let's move on to the next part of the wiring. So the amplifier is all wired up, ready for some testing. Some things to note. I wasn't sure if I had room to put this choke in here. Originally I was just going to put a dropping resistor, but when I started building this I realized if I lay it sideways I had enough room to put that choke. So that is a 6 Henry choke and that's going to do a lot better in removing the rest of the remaining AC ripple from the power supply section. Also, it turns out I did have some nicer quality coupling capacitors in my parts bin, so I swapped those out. And for the input selection I ended up going with some Cat5 cable. So that was enough to do three positions all the way to the switch, and it makes it all nice and neat. So what you're going to do now is put the tubes in and do some voltage testing, and we'll have a listen to it. The new tubes installed. We have the speakers plugged in. If you do want to use speakers, you can run a dummy load, but you do want to have some load on the output transformers. I have my multimeter connected to the first power supply capacitor, and I also have the amplifier plugged into the light bulb current sink. So let's go ahead and turn this to volts DC and then turn the amplifier on. Now you can see the volts are spiking up well above 450 volts. So that's why the power supply capacitors need to be rated for this voltage of PT. Now we can see the voltage drop. Now the tubes are conducting current. And it's a little bit lower than I thought, so we'll have to do some checks here. So what I'll do is I'll run through all the voltage checks and we'll report back. So initial startup, the amplifier seemed to work okay. The voltages were within spec. But when I started comparing against my schematic here, I realized that the bias points for the 12AU7 were a bit off. So off camera, I ended up swapping out a bunch of resistors and checking voltages and doing calculations. And I think I got it pretty good where I think it sounds pretty good to my ears. So what I'll do is I'll reflect that in a proper schematic and I'll link it below. But let's take a look at the voltages I got. So on the first cap, I'm reading 400 volts. On the other side of the choke, I'm reading 380 volts, so that's a 20 volt voltage drop. That's 133 milliamps of total amp current. If I look at the Duncan Amps power supply designer, it pretty much comes in spec to what it simulated. So I have a feeling that the light voltages are off is probably due with my ball voltage, but uh, that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. So if you haven't gone to the Duncan Amps website, please do and take a look. There's a lot of valuable tube amp information there. Download the power supply designer. So if we look at the 12 AU7s, so the first section, I'm reading 1.8 volts on the cathode and 77 volts on the plate, and that equates out to 3.9 milliamps. On the second section, I'm reading 82 volts on the cathode and 245 volts on the plate, and that also equates out to 3.9 milliamps. So that being said, the first half and the second half need to have identical current for optimal performance. So when we're looking at the 6L6, I read 373 volts on the plate. And on the screen, we read 376 volts. And on the cathode, I read 28 volts. And that equates out to 59.5 milliamps of total current, which is 20 watts of total dissipation of the 6L6. If we look at the PS vane tube data, 
you'll see that the maximum dissipation is 23 watts there. So I feel at 20 watts, we have a little bit of room for plus or minus of wall voltage. So I think it's safe to operate this tube at that dissipation. So let's take a look at the layout quickly. From the power transformer, we have our filament circuit. We go to the first 6L6, second 6L6, and then to the two 12AU7s. For the B+, we come out of the transformer to solid state rectification to the first cap. And then we go through a six Henry choke to the second set of caps. And then each 12AU7 has its own filter cap to help for better channel separation. So for the 6L6, it has its 10 watt bias resistor stood off here on its own standoff. And then we have the bypass cap on its own standoff. And then for the input from the output transformers, we have our plate and we also have our ultralinear connection here. And then from the output transformer, it comes back into the chassis and then we feed the speaker jacks in the back. Well, I'm really happy the way this amplifier turned out. It was actually way more work than I thought it would be. Now, I make it look like it was done in a weekend, but it was not done in a weekend. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time on this. Uh, the chassis was quite difficult. I underestimated the thickness of the top plate, and if I were to do it again, I'd do 16 gauge steel to kind of keep it more straight. So one of the tweaks I do going to plan to do is putting constant current sources on the 12 AU7s, and we'll adjust the bias points on that as well. And of course, I'm going to try some negative feedback back to see how that alters the sound as well. As for these PS Fane 6L6 tubes, um, I actually A-B'd them with these uh, RCA black plates and I really couldn't hear a difference between the two. They sound pretty much identical to me so I'll be keeping this in. We'll see how they burn in. If you have any questions or tips or tricks or any suggestions about this amplifier, please let me know. I'll leave a comment below and I'll answer it. Please like and subscribe so you can see the future mods on this amplifier. Once again, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. When I first opened up these 6L6s, I thought, wow, these kind of look like an EL34. So then I pulled out one of my EL34s and I realized, no, they don't really. They're long like an EL34, but the internal structures is totally different. So then I pulled out one of my RCA 6L6 black plates. So some people consider this like a holy grail 6L6 tube. And then I realized, yeah, the internal structure looked very similar to this US made 6L6. So then I pulled out a couple more 6L6s and I realized, yeah, yeah, so this is a GE and the internal structure looks very similar as well. So the bottles are a little bit different. Um, the bases are definitely different, um, but uh, the internal structure is almost the same. So when looking at the Horizon 12 e 7 II, the one thing I noticed that the internal plate structure is actually quite a bit shorter. So when I look at this off-brand of a 12 e 7 you can see that it's quite a bit shorter than this one. And then I have this US-made 12 u 7 and it's still shorter than that one. So I'm suspecting that their claim of lower noise and microphonics has probably has something to do with the shorter plate structure. So the Horizon series, they're taking some of the enhanced features from their premium series and incorporating it into these tubes. So some of the features are an enhanced anode coating. So this has an HPC-X anode coating. The bases here are a composite base. So this asks for extra longevity and rigidity when you're yanking them in and out of the tube socket. And for the smaller tube, so the 12 AU7s, AT7s, AX7s, they're coming with a new internal structure. So that should help with microphonics and low noise. All the tubes come with a 24 hour burning period, so they're ready to go, plug and play.